Hi guys, um, I thought we'd just chat a little bit more about uh, capacitors. Um, we had a good look at them in the last video, um, but there's a couple of things that I didn't mention uh, that I thought we should talk about. Um, one of them in particular is the way that capacitors fail, and one way which they do fail, which I didn't mention before, is they go leaky. What a leaky capacitor is, basically, as I mentioned, a capacitor blocks DC but passes AC. So to a, a DC meter it looks like an open circuit. But capacitors can fail in a way that they effectively start to pass DC. And they start to act like this. Like a capacitor with a resistor in parallel with it. So that basically means that DC can pass. Uh, typically, the resistance is several hundred ohms when they fail, so they might, for instance, like go something like, you know, 300, sort of 700 ohms, some, somewhere in this region. Uh, and this can cause problems, I mean, there's a good example I've seen uh, circuits on uh, a reset pin. So imagine you have uh, a chip, which has a reset pin, yeah? And the idea is that after you've switched on, after so many seconds, uh, the thing powers up. So what you'll have is you'll have a resistor like this to power, let's say it's 12 volts just, you know, why not? And from here you'll have a capacitor typically an electrolytic capacitor to ground. And the idea is when you switch on the 12 volts supplies all the rest of the circuit everything's got power, yeah? But this reset pin has to wait till this capacitor is charged up before this chip can turn on. So basically, all the rest of the circuits have got power, and this point here starts to charge up and charge up and charge up, and at one point it'll reach enough to switch that chip on. And that's how it's supposed to work. I've seen these capacitors, for instance, go leaky. So effectively, that capacitor becomes another resistor like this to ground, yeah? And if this resistor feeding in is usually quite high value to give you know a slow time so this might be say 10 kilo ohms yeah and if this one here goes leaky and say keep round numbers goes to one kilo ohm yeah what will happen is the point voltage here this is now a voltage divider yeah so roughly 10 times the voltage we dropped across this one across this one so the voltage at this point will be a tenth of that approximately um, so the voltage here can never go above 1.2 the capacitor can't charge and I've seen this uh, quite common uh, especially with surface mounts the little square uh, what they call MLCC multi-layer ceramic capacitors so that's another way in which capacitors fail which I didn't uh, mention previously but it's, it's, it's a good one to keep in mind okay um, what else can we say about capacitors well in a way Let's compare them to resistors. Yeah. So on the methods and resistors, we know that two resistors in series, like this, yeah, ground, plus volts. Two resistors like this, the total resistance of the sub is, is the sum of the two. So if this is five kilo five kilo ohms, and this is fifteen kilo ohms, the total will be twenty. Yeah. Resistors wired like this. In parallel, yeah, the resistance halves. So if this is five, yeah, and this is five, the sum will be 2.5, half, yeah, and the more you add, the lower it goes. Capacitors are the opposite. If you have two capacitors in series, yeah, plus volts. Two capacitors wired in series like this, the resistance, the capacitance decreases. So if this is 10 microfarads and this is 10, the total isn't the sum of the two, it's the half. Five microfarads. So this has the same mathematical property as that, if you see what I mean. Yeah? Whereas two capacitors in, par in parallel. If this one's 10 microfarads, 
in this was 10 microfarads, the total will be 20. So that works, it's the sum of the two, like that. So can you see the, the kind of opposite way, yeah? Uh, so that's uh, resistors and power and, and in the series. This you don't really often see, uh, it's not something that you would commonly see uh, capacitors in a series like that. This you see very commonly. And there's a couple of reasons for it. One is to give a very high capacitance. Um, the other one is to have capacitors very close to the load. So for instance, if you've got like your power coming in, yeah, plus volts, not volts, coming in, and here you'll have a large capacitor, yeah, to smooth it. And then th this plus will go to various chips, yeah. I'll just draw a few, these are integrated circuits, yeah? And this power will go to these across the board, yeah? And it's very common to see another capacitor here to ground on each one, very close to the chip. And the reason for this is because when these chips switch on and switch off and do things, the amount of power they draw changes. And this copper track, effectively the wire that's connecting to them, has, has a small amount of resistance. So you can get minute changes in the voltage here because of the resistance of this, because of your capacitors over here. So you'll often see this where, where, where they put, I didn't draw them properly, where they put capacitors here, yeah, to ground, decoupling capacitors. So that's, that effectively is the same as saying capacitors in parallel. Drawing them like that is the same as me drawing it like this. Although it looks it's drawn different, it's the same thing. So that's another reason why you see uh, capacitor and power. Uh, typically, this is a large value, and these are smaller values. Um, the other reason you see capacitors uh, in, in parallel is that large electrolytics are very good at passing low frequency AC down to ground, but they're not very good at passing high frequency AC down to ground. Smaller value capacitors are the opposite way around. They're very good at passing high frequency AC to ground, but not so good at low. So what you'll often again find is you'll find a power rail like this, naught volts, and you'll have large electrolytic capacitor, and then you'll have a small capacitor. So this might be like 100 microfarads, and this might be 0 0.1 microfarads, or 100 nanofarads, same, means the same thing. So you often see that as well. So this capacitor takes the low frequency uh, ripple noise to ground and removes it, and this one handles the high frequency noise spikes, yeah? So that's another reason why you'll see uh, capacitor in parallel. Okay, um, the other thing I want to talk about is what happens when resistors fail and capacitors fail. So again, they're the opposite really. So if you look at resistors, yeah, and look at capacitors. These tend to go open circuit, yeah? These tend to go short circuit. These tend to go high resistance when they fail. So effectively, the resistance increases from the, its rated value. Say it was rated at like 1 kilo ohm, it might go to 30 kilo ohms, yeah? The, the resistance goes high. Capacitors, when they fail, tend to go to low capacitance, the opposite way around. These lose capacitance, they gain resistance, the opposite way again. Um, capacitors have other ways to fail. Uh, this, we mentioned this on resistors, noisy. Resistors can go noisy, like microscopic cracks in them, and, and the resistance is varying and producing noise in the, in the signal, the voltage passing through. Capacitors can do the same thing. They can go noisy, but it's more common with resistors, okay? Um, capacitors f fail in ways that resistors can't fail. Um, so these go leaky, as I've just mentioned. You can't get, and this is electrically leaky, not uh, not an electrolytic capacitor where all the guns leaks out of it, yeah? These go leaky. Um, these can also fail where they go high, ESR. This means the capacitor still 
passes AC to ground yeah but whereas it was designed so that there's an AC signal coming down here at a certain frequency with look at this as maybe like a 0.1 ohm effectively 0.1 ohms to ground it's never short it's always has some resistance some impedance yeah uh, which varies with the frequency <laughs> so it's supposed to act like a 0.1 ohms at a certain frequency let's say 100 kilohertz yeah and what's happened is this is increased so it still passes 100 kilohertz but this is now gone to maybe say 2 ohms yeah so it can no longer as effectively pass the AC and that's important in some circuits especially power supply circuits um, other thing with resistors resistors when resistors fail it's usually because of something else of something else a short circuit causing too much current through the resistor and causing it to burn up quite often or go high resistance or open circuit. When capacitors fail, it's usually the capacitor. Capacitor, yeah? That's, that's, the, that's the faulty item. So in the case of the burnt out resistor, you change the resistor and if you didn't find the original cause, it will just burn out again. In the case of the capacitor, it's normally the capacitor, yeah? Um, because capacitors can go short circuit, whereas resistors can't really, capacitors are more likely to cause damage to other components. I mean, resistors can cause damage to other components, depending on the circuit, but capacitors more so because of the fact they go short. Um, so, in a lot of ways, these two are sort of opposite. Another thing, when the resistor burns up or goes high resistance, it normally causes a fault yeah something doesn't work yeah with a capacitor it's quite common for a capacitor to fail but not necessarily cause a fault um, you can have a situation where I mentioned uh, the capacitors in, in parallel like this where you might have like a hundred of these across the board yeah and if one or two of them not, if they go short, it causes a fault. But if one or two of these are missing, or the, or the, the effectively open circuit, high ESR, it probably won't cause a problem because there's so many of them all, all in parallel. Uh, also, often capacitors are used just um, they, to make a circuit resilient to like interference, external interference, and noise. But they're not kind of like doing that all the time. If the external interference doesn't exist, then the capacitor is doing nothing. And it's quite often, again, to find circuits with capacitors where a capacitor, you can even take it out of the circuit and it will probably still work in a lot of cases, or it will still work in a lot of cases. Um, it may affect the circuit in such a way that if you give it high stress, say like a processor, a CPU, when it's idling, if some of these capacitors are missing, it probably isn't a problem. When it's running at 100%, uh, you know, speed, processing power, then it can cause little voltage fluctuations, and the missing capacitor might cause a problem. But again, that's different. So resistor fails normally causes a fault, and capacitor fails often still works. Yeah, the, the circuit, not the capacitor. Device often still works. That doesn't mean you shouldn't change them, uh, but I've had situations where I've had a short circuit capacitor, one of the hundred of these on the board, and I remove the short circuit one, and if I didn't have a replacement, I'd just take it out, and I don't worry about it because it will still work. I've had the same with capacitors broken off the board, you know, they've, they've broken off, they're not there, it'll still work in a lot of cases. So let's just talk a little bit more about capacitors uh, and I think then we've covered everything we need to know from a repair point of view. Uh, first thing I'd like to mention is, you remember when I was um, testing capacitors and I was uh, charging them up and showing you how a capacitor takes a charge? Uh, and I mentioned, if you recall, if you were watching the, the first part of this video, that the capacitor was discharging because I had an LED on my power supply that was discharging it. Uh, and I wasn't very clear about that, so I thought I'd just show you what, what, what I was meaning. Uh, so here's a capacitor, and um, we'll charge the capacitor up, so I have a 12 volt supply, and I'm going to switch the 12 volt supply on. So, this capacitor now, if we take the, the voltmeter, should be charged to 12 volts. 
so we just uh, check across the terminals and there we have 12 volts and then if you remember I disconnected the leads from the power supply and we check again and we still have around 12 volts you may have discharged a little bit 12 volts and it's I mean it, it, it's dropping very very slowly uh, but I also, uh, with the leads connected, I turned off the power supply. If I just uh, get the leads to stay on there, so I have a hand free. Yeah, 12 volts. And the capacitor was, so yeah, the capacitor was discharging very quickly like this. And I mentioned about the LED on the power supply. So I just want to show you uh, what I have here that explains uh, what was happening there uh, quite clearly. So basically, I have a, I have a bench power supply. PSU, yeah, and it's uh, 0 to 30 volts and it's 0 to 3 amps. And I have it at the 12 volts, so I have 12 volts coming in. The power supply is then connecting to a switch like this. Here's a switch, yeah, and from the switch here, I have an LED. To ground, and I have terminals coming out. And sorry, there's a resistor here, of course. Uh, so when I switch the switch on, the LED lights up and the 12 volts comes out. It's just an indicator that tells me I have power on the switch. When I switch the switch off, this LED is still connected to the load. So in my case, I was connecting from here a capacitor. Yeah, so when I switch the switch on, this lights up and the capacitor charges up. When I open the switch, the capacitor was then discharging through this LED. And I'll show you what the thing actually is that I have. Let me just, uh, let me have to just move the camera a little bit. Okay, so this is it. So this is coming in from my power supply. Yeah, this is the LED I was talking about. And I've just switched this off. This, this switch switches, it's on and off. And then these crocodile clips are on the output. So in my case, the capacitor's charged it's still charged that's why this is off and this is on I'll show you in a minute because it'll discharge I should have discharged the capacitor first just to show this clearly so that's now discharging in fact I'll go one better I'll short the, I'll short the capacitor out so it's discharged yeah so when I switch this on the power comes in and charges the capacitor so here I get 12 volts as you'd expect I'm we'll just uh, prop this under here so I've got the hands spare. You need three hands to do electronics, by the way. It, really, we should have evolved three hands, I think, for, for this sort of job. I'll make life easy. Let's just grab a little uh, crocodile clip, eh? So I'm not messing about with this, right? Let's have a bit of crocodile clip on here. Let's make life easy. One crocodile clip. Uh, we'll connect this to the negative lead. Yeah, and we put the positive lead on here. We have 12. We have 12 volts. Okay. So when I switch this switch off, if you notice, the LED stays on. And this is discharging. Because the capacitor is now powering the LED. Gradually, the LED will get dimmer. And at the point where the LED reaches its forward voltage, effectively it'll go out and it'll stop dropping. 2.35, 2.34, you see it's dropping slowly now. This is drawing almost no current. When the voltage in the capacitor drops below the forward voltage of the LED, it'll actually go out. Getting very close to it now. And obviously it's drawing very little current now, so it's discharging slower. So that is why, when I was showing the capacitors originally, they were discharging and I said oh it's because of my LED on my power supply it's this it's set to draw 10 milliamps to about 12 volts actually so that is why we were having that capacity discharge and I, and I mentioned it but I don't think I was very clear so I hope now that is much clearer and teaches you a little bit about LEDs and capacitors yeah. so I wanted to mention that uh, the other thing I just wanted to mention was speak about whether or not we can test capacitors and circuits. So
if you have a circuit board and you suspect you have a faulty capacity and you test it and the answer to that is sort of like yes and no um, what you can't do really is read the capacitance and the reason being because there's a lot of other components and circuits in a lot of case if you may use a capacitor meter and measure across the capacitor you won't read the correct value you may have lots of other ones in parallel and read much higher um, but if you read across a capacitor and you read less than the rated value that's the reason to suspect the capacitor's got a problem if you're reading less than the rated value of capacitance, microfarads and nanofarads but to be truthfully sure you need to take it out of the circuit and measure it out of the circuit uh, if a capacitor has gone short circuit then yes you can measure it you can find the short circuit so a short circuit capacitor in circuit yes you can find uh, if a capacitor has gone leaky sometimes you can find that as well especially uh, if there's only one capacitor connected like say a reset pin on, on an IC or say a microcontroller and the microcontroller won't start because the reset pin won't go high and if you read from the reset pin to ground across the capacitor and you read a couple hundred ohms or something you've almost certainly got a leaky capacitor or a faulty microcontroller so leaky yes short certainly yes capacitors no ESR no there's usually too many devices in parallel with the one you want to test um, so how would you measure uh, a capacitor well a multimeter set to resistance mode will tell you if a capacitor is short or, is short or not yeah um, you also um, can use the uh, the multimeter to find the leaky capacitor uh, but what you will notice and I'm just going to get a circuit board to show you this just one, one second So this is our scrap motherboard uh, we used to take the PCI slot off uh, a week or two last week or so just to see if that was possible to do uh, and on here there, there's some electrolytic capacitors yeah and what I'm going to do I'm just going to take my test meter and just measure across these capacitors with the, re with the resistance range and I want to show you something so here these legs are two of the capacitors so if I measure the resistance across here you see it's bleeped and then the reading starts climbing up the reason it bleeped and the reading started climbing up is because the capacitors are charging and they'll take some time at 350 ohms now and for the small amount of current from, coming from my test meter it'll take some time for the reading to settle so it's quite often with a, like an electrolytic capacitor or a large capacitor when you first measure it will bleep now I'm going to reverse the polarity which will discharge the capacitor and then charge it the opposite way opposite polarity and this will probably bleep for longer not so noticeable on that one I'll try a larger capacitor but you often get this across the capacitor see the blee and that's what it's charging the, the other way so as it charges it passes some DC current and it reads as a low resistance so by that in mind with a, a multimeter measuring capacitors especially larger value capacitors that you will see that uh, these are on the vehicle let's try these yeah, again, bleep, and then the resistance starts climbing up. Yeah, so this is what you're going to get when you're measuring voltage core across the capacitors, this sort of thing. It's also uh, sort of voltage core across these. I'm pointing to one camera now. So this also makes it difficult sometimes to measure the resistance of, of a voltage rail. You have to wait, hold your meter on, and let the capacitors charge up to give you a true reading. Once it's gets a bit where it's only increasing very slowly that's that's the effect with the resistance so that's what you'll find in circuit um so you can use a multimeter a multimeter right. but and this multimeter by the way has a capacitance range um the only thing i just on the on the capacitance if you can see that i have to hold the button in twice it's now reading nanofarads yeah the problem with the the multimeter for reading capacitors, at least mine, is it won't read very high capacitance, it'll just go over value. See, so over value, it, it, it can't read over limit, it, it can't read the capacitance because it's too high. Uh, I've got a feeling this will only read to about 10 
10 microfarads. I mean, he's just one capacity to this. He's, um, what's this one? 1,000 microfarads, common value that. Let's just uh, measure the capacitance across the capacitor. Put the lead back in. Uh, and it'll just go over value, yeah? So you may have a capacitance range built into your multimeter, but you need to check the specification to see whether or not it can read larger capacitors. Uh, very useful to have as a capacitance meter for that reason. Uh, this one goes up to uh, 20,000 microfarads. That's the highest it will read. Uh, I'll put it onto the 2,000 range. This was a 1,000, as we said. So we can just uh, read across this, observing the polarity of the capacitor to get a proper reading. Yeah, 1,069. So that's quite handy. That will read uh, capacitors. So capacitance meter is very useful. The last thing we can use to test capacitance is an ESR meter. This measures the equivalent serial resistance. I have talked about this. This tells you how well a capacitor is actually conducting. So in this case, this will not read the capacitance. It will just tell you the resistance of this capacitor at a frequency of 100 kilohertz, which should be low. So uh, let's stay on here. Hold the leads in because you not, don't connect very well. This one has 0 0.016 ohms. I'll just vary that a little bit. I'm just trying to get a good connection on these uh, contacts. I could do with some new leads for this actually. No, it's even a bit lower than that. Okay, so that is an ESR meter. And different capacitors will, will have different ESRs. And this can be important. Um, in some cases, the, the ESR of the capacitor is pretty much critical. Another one. Zero point zero six. It's wandering about a bit. I do need some better leads for this meter, but that's a low ESR for sure. Um, let's see what happens with a, a bad capacitor. Uh, this one is one that's. Can you see the top of it is like bulge, it's gone concave. I'll try and get a bit of focus on that for you. This is a bad capacitor. So the top has bulged outwards. Uh, it also feels very light. You probably find all the fluids gone out of this. So what happens to a, a bad capacitor when it goes like this? Well, let's have a look. This one's rated for 1,500 microfarads. So we'll set the meter to 2,000. And um, we'll have a look. Let's just uh, put the meters across the capacitor. What have we got? Zero. No capacitance. That's the faulty capacitor. Now, what happens if we put the ESR meter on that? Well, it's certainly more than one ohm. Let's go to the next range. This actually has various ranges on it, mode range, 1 to 10. It's more than 10 ohms. So that that capacitor has gone very high SR, and this is what happens to capacitors often when they fail, especially electrolytics. Um, so that's roughly how you would go about testing capacitors. Uh, ESR meters are a very useful bit of equipment to have. There are kits you can build your own. Maybe we'll try one on the channel, actually. We'll get one of the kits and put one together and see how well it works. Uh, capacitance meter, about £20. Definitely worth having. Uh, ESR meter, yeah, probably the similar price. You may get a kit, a kit to build yourself cheaper than that. Definitely worth having. And if you remember, I use this to trace it short circuits as well in book regulators uh, to see which side of the coil was a short circuit. Uh, so that's capacitors. Uh, last thing I want to mention. Um, with resistors, if you have a faulty resistor, it's burnt out or it's high resistance, as long as you get another resistor that has basically the same resistance or close and uh, it has the same wattage or more, it will work. You put the resistor in the circuit, it will work you know, it, it doesn't matter. As long as the resistance is the same and the wattage is more than the original one, 
that's all. Uh, but one possible ex uh, exception to that is uh, zero inductance resistors you find in power amplifiers, but that that's very much an exception. It's it's, it's not a, a common thing. Uh, but you, you know, apart from that one, really, change a resistor with another resistor, same value, more wattage, it'll be fine. Capacitors are not like that. With capacitors, it's often critical to the type of capacitor, the ESR, uh, and, and some other factors. I would suggest that if you're going to change capacitors especially on motherboards and this sort of thing uh, and switch mode power supplies go to this forum which is free and I've mentioned it before badcaps.net go and register a free account on there if you haven't done so already and go into the general in, uh, you know questions area for capacitors and just ask just take a photograph say well, this is the device this is the faulty capacitor can I replace it with this if you've got something you're thinking of replacing it with or what can I use to replace it and there's some very knowledgeable guys on there who know capacitors like the back of the hand and they'll be able to tell you if you can fit this or if you can fit that even I go on there uh, for capacitors quite often uh, because I'm not sure myself I'm not an expert on that uh, I can certainly find bad ones and change them but I often will say especially motherboards I'll say can I fit this or can I fit that uh, I really hope uh, now you know pretty much everything there is to know about uh, capacitors and um, I'll see you on another video now. Cheers guys.